where we, we go for there. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, a one-line job description of a parent. Provider. Look after, Mike. look after their kids. Getting close. Teacher. Role model. Nurture. <laughs> well, I only have 15 minutes, so I have to cut it off and give you mine. And you can have the, have the conversation afterwards. A person who works for a generation to create a successful adult. So the parent in us is an intergenerational thinker. We cannot be anything else. So we're worried about short-termism. Remember, the parent in us is ultimately not. So one of my, when I talk with clients, I tell them to take the parent in them to work. So suddenly we are not confronting the, the bottom line in three months' time. We're talking about how we shape the next generation. And the one thing that all parents want is to help create a world, embed skills in their own kids, so they can thrive in a generation's time. That's not a bad start, is it? So, all parents are future shapers without really realising it. All I ask is you take your parent everywhere else. And suddenly we start thinking differently. We all think short term, tomorrow, even this afternoon. And we try to shape the future over many ways. Indeed, if you add up all the time we spend shaping the future, in all its forms, it counts about 60% of our living awake time. I get to do, 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 who am I going to meet tomorrow? I'm going to buy a new house. I'm going to start a new relationship. Where I'm going to have my holiday. And you know something? We never learn how to do it at school. It's extraordinary. I actually think it's one of the two most important things we learn to do in life. And we've never been taught how to do it well. So we come in, bumble through, we learn things, and we're all relatively unskilled. The people who are very good at it become famous entrepreneurs and CEOs. But actually, we can all learn to do that. I've actually dedicated my whole career path to developing skill sets. And I'm doing, now I've developed the skill sets, and now I'm actually creating some software. So. I think in about two years' time, people would go onto their iPad, hit the app, and shape their future. That's what I have planned to do now. The other big thing we have to learn to do well, and we're not very good at that either, is how do we nurture, form and nurture, and sometimes end relationships. Now, we never shape the future alone, and you would know that when we do it, we tend to make a mess and things are fighting amongst each other. When we shape the future, we have actually six tools. Leadership, management, planning, design, innovation and learning. The manager in us is what I call the resilient future taker. The, the leader in us is the purposeful future maker. Okay? I'm going to explain this in, a bit, uh, in my 15 minutes, but it has to be quick, but that's the first thing. Now, planning, design... We're just going to talk about those, so I'll pass that over to her. But, uh, but I'm also going to, I am going to talk a bit about innovation, because it's actually one of my beloved subjects. How do I talk about an innovation that will exist in 30 years' time, but doesn't exist now, so we can have a conversation about it? I developed a concept called ways and ways to do that. Ways are the innovations to what we do, and where's are the innovations to what we use? So a water conservation way would be shortening your shower from six to three minutes. And a water conservation where would be a low volume shower here. And together they create water conservation. Now, let's talk about we need more water conservation. Imagine the ways and where's we get that, that alone. Now, I spent, in my books, I have hundreds and hundreds of ways and where's. For example, I'll just give you one. Buckminster Fuller famously said, we have to learn to live within perpetual solar income. He pointed out there's 10,000 times more energy right from, on this planet from the sun every day that we could ever use. You would know people who create ways and ways to live within perpetual solar income just might become 21st century billionaires, yes? Ah, now we can talk about the emerging economy. Because I don't talk about the widget or gadget we have, I talk about the purposes, okay? And that's the important, that's important part. Now, here, there we are. 
Okay, that's the first part. The second part I want to talk about is, they're the tools we use. And a lot of my work is working on management and leadership, indeed. Oops, I went one way. That's the manager and that's the leader. I go, if I have a bit of time, I'll go into them. I'll just talk about a couple of them, actually. You noticed Mark talked about what will things be like in 20, 30 years' time. That's one thing, a question you can ask. The other question is what should or could things be like in 20 years or 30 years' time? They are fundamentally different questions. The manager's question is what will be, the leader's question what should or could be. And George Bernard Shaw said that beautifully in a play called Back to Methuselah, where he said something which was plagiarised subsequently by Bobby Kennedy. But the original GBS quote was, you see things and you say why. I dream things that never were, and I say, why not? Okay? That's the, that's the leader, the why not person. The manager and the resilient future taker is the manager. Okay, the manager is the leader. You talked about being cautious. I say you should be careful. Think about the difference between cautious and careful. I could go into this, but I don't have time. Down the bottom, though, profit and visionary. The profit part of each of us, the future's in us is actually, in us is actually two people. The what will be person, the profit, and the what should or could be person, the visionary. Australia has too much prophecy and not enough vision, right? We are lacking in vision. We are lacking in leadership. And we have too many what will be people and not enough what should or could be people. The balance is wrong, and that's why we're struggling to actually create heroic leads in the, getting into the, getting in the 21st century. And Gary Hamill famously said, success goes to those who get to the future first. Now, the what will be person is a probable futurist. The what should or could be future is the preferred futurist. A futurist. My company is called the Preferred Futures Institute. So that's where I am. And there are actually six futures, but I'm only talking about these two. The what will be, probable, and what could or should be preferred. You might, every question you can think about in the future, you can frame in those two questions. Please ask both questions, not just one. And suddenly you can invent the ways and ways to create that future. Down the bottom, not only the destinations questions of the manager and leader in each of us is different, but the strategy to get there is different. The manager is what I call the problem-centered person. In Australia, to be a problem solver is a heroic badge. I unconditionally say to you, I think it's a national curse. If all we're doing is removing, re resolving problems and removing bad things from the future, we're merely creating a future that's less awful. <laughs> not wonderful, not magnificent, not heroic. To create one of those, we have to imagine a wonderful, magnificent or heroic future. We cannot work to create a future that we do not imagination. Imagination is the future as memory is of the past. And Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. <coughs> so, the, 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 ma the manager part of us is the problem set of strategist towards the problem of the future. We need those. The leader is the preferred future and the mission directed strategist. The, 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 the mission directed strategy of a good leader is, has five bits. What are the impediments I need to remove? What are the new initiatives I need to take? What are the improvements I need to make? What's the heritage I to need to keep and nurture? And what's the baggage I have to identify and throw out? So, quickly, on to the second part of my tool. That's the shaping the future bit, which I can embellish perhaps in questions. Now the question is, we have to be cognizant of what's happening in the world today. Can I predict what people will want to buy and sell in 30 years' time? I think the answer is yes to that question. Most people think you can't, but I'm going to give you, tell you how to do it. Okay? If I understand the values of 2030, I'll understand what people value and find to be valuable in the year 2030. What they value and find to be valuable, they want more of and create products and services and markets too. So we need ways and ways <coughs> for intercultural harmony. For example, or living within solar income. Okay, I could give you lots of... Recently, I was in New Zealand working with the Electoral Commission of New Zealand on democratic democracy futures. 
And I pointed out at the end of the Second World War there were just 12 democracies on the planet and there's 135 today. Some of them are not very good, but they don't know how to do democracy. Does Egypt know how to do democracy? Of course they don't. But New Zealand and Australia were two of the 12 and we got to the future first. So the idea that we can actually set up a democracy export industry to the world and export democracy ways and wares, like free and fair elections ways and wares, and democratic institution ways and ways is the way we create new industrial futures for ourselves. Now, three years ago, I was out at Meredith in Victoria, <coughs> out here north of between Geelong and Ballarat, at what is called the Golden Plains Music Festival. A lot of young people will know that. And uh, we, there was three days of music, and on the Sunday morning they had me talking to a whole 10,000 fairly sore heads <laughs> <laughs> on the future. And I, um, I asked them this question. Which one of these sums up your world view? Tribalism, tribalism, first allegiance to tribe. Nationalism, first allegiance to nation. Planetism, first allegiance to planet. And 10,000 hands went up for planetism. Now I coined that word. They'd never heard the word before. But I said, that's me. They came up to me and said, gee, it's nice to have a word which explains who I am. They don't see, that's why they say they're not interested in joining the Labour Party and the Liberal Party. But they are enjoying it, related. They are fighting for climate change and to save Wales, because they are the international things, the global events, the things that spread across nations. So they are, these people are already dancing on a global stage. They're thinking, the planet is where my first allegiance is, and that's where, Jen, why the millennials are already. How we got up there was a long story, and I don't have enough time to tell it, but basically we had modernism up to 2050. Modernism believed in progress. You know, everything new was good, everything old was out. My father's generation is you can't stop progress. Whoopee, well, something happened about 1970. Joni Mitchell wrote a famous song called Big Yellow Taxi. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot, yes? And something happened at that magic moment. What was it? But two years before, it's 1970. Apollo 8. We saw the first view of our planet through the cameras of Apollo 8. A blue and white planet, black in the, in the blackness of space, in the foresight, in the foreground of a uh, lifeless moonscape. That changed everything. It was not so accident that in 1969, I actually worked with Henry Skip Jackson in America to write up, create the National Environment Policy Act, which went through the US Congress. And right after that, I came back to Australia and I became Chief of Staff of Environment Minister in the Whitlam Government. And I wrote the Heritage Acts and the Great Barrier, the first Environment Minister, big major Environment Minister in the country. Suddenly we saw this fragile planet Earth and the era of the environment was born. And now that since then we've actually learnt more about the environment. We've used, we, we use this word sustainable. Sustainability. You know something? We've talked about it for 40 years, but most people still don't understand it. I have a one-line job description of sustainable action. Zero net collateral damage to other. If I can do something I cause collateral damage, which I can't fix, I've, I, I, that's unsustainable. And I actually turn that around in my work with health futures and talk about a healthy action is zero net collateral damage to self. So I don't work with engineers to say how I can design sustainable projects. And those are two very big projects. But so we came out after Johnny Mitchell's song and so on, we became postmodern. And we changed the language we used. What we used to call swamps became wetlands. <laughs> what we call slums became heritage precincts. <laughs> and suddenly, and we said, Indigenous people matter. The environment matters. We've been trashing them out in the name of progress. Can't stop in progress. There's a few people who still want to do that. The people trying to get the Carmichael mine up trying to do that. But the world's opinion has changed. And so suddenly postmodernity is born. Now I'll just give a quick example of postmodernity. You give you go to your doctor, the doctor says, This is wrong with what's wrong with you, get your pills from the chemist. But you said, Yes, well, I might try that, but I might uh, check out the Tai Chi Chuan, or the, the yoga, or the shiatsu, <coughs> or the acupuncture, and quite this mixture of both old and new. Now the doctor said, all that's quackery, you just take your pills. He's the unreconstructed modernist and you're the postmodern customer. 
and we now retrofit heritage buildings with modern things rather than knock them over in the name of progress and put something ghastly in this place, as we used to do. Look at these, tower, these towers around it in the precincts in Melbourne. We were all in the name of progress. But postmodernity is a halfway house for planetism. And planetism is bought, has been born now and it will fully flower by 2050. And by 2045, it will be everywhere. The kids and the values of planetism are there. That's modern, that's, that's George W. Bush, that's, a Derek, that's, that's Obama amongst other people. I could go, well, this is too long to go into. But these are the value shifts. But quickly, communitarianism versus individualism. In Paris next week, the week after, we all now have to fix this planet up together. Don't we? Individual nations don't have the right to pollute as they like because we have one shared atmosphere and one shared planet and one shared future. That's un not negotiable. So, interdependence, the next one, a marriage is interdependent, and interdependence means two individual, ind individual ind independent people give up some other independence because of the benefit that comes from union. Well, right now, in dealing with climate change, for example, we all have to give some of our rights to pollute so we can save the planet collectively. And that's the big challenge. And the important thing is we have to have win-wins. We can't have win-losers. If you had a marriage that delivers constant win-losses, the marriage is not going to last, is it? But win-win is the only way in the 21st century. And that's why the, the conferences like Paris are so hard. Everyone in 190 countries, they said we all have had a win, individually and collectively. That's very hard to do. And that's the narrative of the 21st century. And it's going on. Humanity part of nature. That's the pre-modern view, but it's now the post-modern and planetist view. And we used to think that it, I, this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is the this is ISIL, isn't it? But the rest of us, the entire planet has taken ISIL. Because we're all over here, aren't we? Now, you might think about the fact is, how could ISIL ever survive more than five years? The entire planet is against them. The Russians, the Germans, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Americans, the whole of Southeast Asia. At least when Hitler tried to take on the world for his thousand year Iraq, which lasted for 12 years, he had half the planet on his side. It's not what ISIL will be dead in five years, if not sooner. And because we have conflict, we used to fight, we still do when we have to. But where is this where we prefer to be? So I think about cooperation and negotiating ways and ways. The same about gender equality ways and with. All they're the values which will shape the 21st century the market. And how do we know that? Because the values to valuable, to wanting more of, to creating market, demanding markets and creating markets. Okay? Now that's I've used up my time, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> You're very tolerant. <laughs> I know I've used up my time, so I'm just gonna stop there. But I could talk for two hours, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, just let me say this, I'll give you a couple of thoughts to finish. And they matter, they, these things matter. We cannot work to create a future that we do not first imagine. We do everything twice, when first we imagine it, and the second time when we do it. Imagination is the most priceless thing we have when it comes to thinking about the future. So when your kids are going crazy with imagination, Say hooray, don't say scream down. That's the most celebration of the human, the human ingenuity is the best thing we have to create to shape our own future. The second one is this. Those who don't live in the future today will live in the past tomorrow. <coughs> if you smell all your time smelling the roses, you're going to get run over by the future. It's very nice, but the world doesn't stop. You spend all the time shaping your future and not spending enough time, you lose all your relationships. Your wife will walk out or you whatever. But you have to have the combination of both the being, the being part of us and the becoming part of us. And we, don't, we have too many people being stodgy but in the being. There's a few people are constantly becoming and they can't stop. And finally, this is my mantra. This comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, do not follow where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trap. Thank you. Thank you.